So have we had enough of that subject? No. 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 I would have thought by now you'd be exhausted with that. <laughs> um, what I want to do um, now is actually pull into play um, some realisations that I've had through, well, some memories that I've had through the week that uh, will help you see how much our holding on to our own emotional condition actually does affect everyone around us. And every time you justify to yourself to hold on to your own emotional condition, what you're really doing is actually holding on to the desire to harm others in the process. And what I would like to do is sort of illustrate that to you through some of the memories that I've had this week. Myself and Mary this week have had quite an emotional time. Um, Mary's starting to open up her soulmate half of herself, which means that uh, she's dealing with a lot of her grief about what happened between myself and her in the first century and, uh, and after I passed. And, and so she's now uh, pretty securely out of her anger emotions uh, about the whole issue of, uh, of having her soulmate drawn back into her life. And now she's feeling a lot more of the grief and connecting with a lot more of the grief. And as a result of that, uh, we often uh, process quite a lot. I've got, I've got a long list of soulmate emotions that I've been working on uh, for some time and, and are all grieving type emotions which I've been working my way through. And so the other morning, uh, it was after Mary's first workshop, she's been quite busy this week and last week, feeling quite tired now as a result of it. But um, during, the, during the break in between the two workshops, which was a weekend and then during the week, so this was Monday and Tuesday, we finished up processing quite a lot. Mary spent sort of the entire two days. Uh, oh, thanks, my water, darling. Thank you. Can I get a kiss too? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what's been happening is that uh, she's been feeling a lot of her grief uh, and reconnecting with a lot of her soulmate based emotions and uh, and I've been having a lot of uh, emotions come up for myself too and one morning anyway uh, we were sleeping apart that night and the next morning I woke up quite early about five o'clock in the morning uh, with a really strong sense of dread and um, which I've had a lot through my life and and I just allowed myself to start processing through it and I, I uh, spent quite a lot of the morning crying probably till about um, till the time Mary woke which was about eight o'clock or so and in this process um, I had a lot of memories return to me about destiny and fate um, so a lot of people have a lot of questions about destiny versus fate. And uh, so y you could say, I'm going to make this discussion about the human soul and I'm going to call it fate and destiny. The truth is that um, you have only two possible destinies. The first possible destiny is that you will become the perfect, perfect, natural human. <coughs> at some time in your future. That's the first possible destiny. Now, how long it takes you to get to that will depend very much upon your willingness to deal with lots of different emotions and beliefs that are out of harmony with natural love. Now, for some people, it's taken them many thousands of years to reach that state. That state, by the way, is the state of the sixth sphere in the spirit world and it's the state of uh, being perfected within yourself and perfected in self-reliance. 
It's a beautiful state to live in, as you might imagine, or some of you, most of us probably can't even imagine how beautiful that state is to live in. But the truth is that when you speak with a lot of the spirits, you'll find that they feel just that state is a beautiful state. <clears throat> the second possible destiny that you have is to become the divine angel. That state is an eternally progressive state. In other words, it doesn't stop at a dimensional space or existence. So this is the stopping at the sixth dimension. This state, um, at the moment, there are 22 dimensions or spheres. Right? And it continues above that state. This is the only state in which you become at one with your soulmate. Whereas this state is a, a state where you're not even yet at one with God. And, and you're definitely not at one with your soulmate. Now, the beauty of the process of becoming the divine angel, or in other words, the beauty of the process of becoming at one with God, is that God heals all of your emotional injuries towards the genders, towards the opposite gender. Does that make sense? And in the process of the developing relationship with God, because God has this immense love for you, and this love is an actual substance, it's an actual thing, that changes your soul. It physically changes the structure of your soul. So if you could look at a soul in terms of as a, as a picture, you would actually see its structure change. And when you're in the 22nd sphere state, you can actually watch the structure of the soul changing as a person receives divine love. And the structure of the soul changes so much that you could no longer call it a human anymore. The soul has now changed into this complete structure, although it is possible to still live here on earth in that state. So, so you can still be human, but the, st the structure of the soul is very, very different in that state to the structure of the soul in this state. And in fact, that's exhibited by the spirit body of the soul in that state. So the spirit body of a person in this state has seven primary chakras, which are all open, both at the rear and at the front of the body. And all of those are operating in a clockwise direction and they're all open emotionally. In this state, there are many other crossovers of energy points that start occurring and you start having you start actually growing more chakras if you like even in your spirit body as a result and the reason why no, nobody's drawn it on earth is because there's only ever been one person in that place on earth and so nobody's been able to see it and then draw it and then get passed down through the generations but in this generation many of you will get to this state and therefore, many of you will be able to draw it and, and also demonstrate it to others in terms of what it feels like, which is more important. So they are the only two destinies that are really ahead of you. One of those others. Now, how long it takes you to reach one of those two destinies is totally dependent upon your desire and passion. And that's why tomorrow I want to talk about developing a passion for God, right? Because it's very dependent. This one is very dependent upon that. Now, as you receive divine love into your soul, you start realising that actually God has far more love than obviously any other being in the universe. That being the case, as God's love enters me and transforms me, it also makes me more capable of loving others. But... The interesting thing is, the way God's designed this entire process, you have to come to God first before you can unify with your soulmate. Because the soul union actually occurs in the 21st to 22nd sphere transformation. Whereas the divine angel actually occurs in the 7th and 8th sphere transformation. So there's actually 14 dimensional spaces in, beyond at one moment with God which you will be transforming to become at one with your soulmate. Does that make sense? And the reason why the transformation is required is because to become at one with God is quite simple in a way, because in the end, it's about receiving divine love into your soul to the point where you no longer block that love flowing 
And now that that love is flowing completely through you at any one point in time, and there's no blockages within your soul for that love to flow through you at all times, what happens in that state is now you are at one with God. You are automatically at one with God just with God's love passing through you. But that doesn't mean that the amount of love you have between you and your soulmate, and assuming it's a heterosexual soul couple, I'll draw them like so, the love between yourself and your soulmate will not be identical. In other words, to become at one with your soulmate, you've got to have the same amount of love for each other and both parties have to have it. And not only that, you have to be as open and vulnerable towards your soulmate as she is towards you, in my case. Does that make sense? So in other words, you're growing in this relationship. And that, that growth occurs even beyond the seventh sphere, seventh to eighth sphere transition, which is beyond the point of one with God. You will continue to grow until you get to the point where you're so open towards your soulmate and she open towards you that you're now at one with everything that you do, feel, say, think, desire, everything. Everything is, you are now back at that one soul. You are now one soul with the two expressions, the feminine and the masculine expression. So that's where you're headed. Now obviously to become like that, as we were just talking earlier, any blockages I have towards the male or any blockages I have towards the female are going to prevent that state. So I can dream all I like about having a soulmate relationship, but while I remain blocked towards the opposite gender in any way, and while I attempt to control, manipulate and manoeuvre the opposite gender in any way, I am never going to become at one with my soulmate. And ironically, I'm never going to become at one with God either in that state. Right. If you've got the blockages, yeah. Now, this being our destinies, one of those two destinies are our destinies. It's our choice. You have a choice between the red pill and the, the pill and the blue pill. <laughs> right. And it, is it the red one that gives you all the truth? I think it's the red one from the matrix. And, uh, and the red one frees you from the matrix. Yep. And uh, the blue one just numbs it all back out again, back into the matrix again. And the truth is that, if you could think of it, these two things are what God has given you as a choice between. Now, in, in the scope of those two things, there is li literally an unlimited a number of things you can do and choose to enjoy. But in the end, if we're talking about the word destiny, these are the only two destinies that you will ever get to be. Now, I don't know what's beyond this state because as yet there's no one who's experienced what's beyond this state. So that destiny, if you like, is an infinite destiny continuously growing and always changing. So as a result of that, nobody here or even in the spirit world yet knows what that is going to end up to be. We can only postulate and come up with ideas as to what it may be, but until somebody first experiences it, we will not know what it is. Does that make sense? And that's the beauty of what God has created too. This is an infinite, this is an infinite progression, infinite progression, whereas this is finite in its progression. In other words, it can only end in the progression up to the sixth sphere. Now, I don't know about you, but I know what one I want to choose. And, uh, um, but as you've already learnt, many of you, and many of you have now come along to the workshops that Mary's been presenting, many of you have already learnt now that it's a, lot, it's a lot more in it in terms of dealing with the emotions than you perhaps realised before, right? So, but that all being said, you can also feel the truth in it, can't you? Like in your soul, you can feel it resonating with you all the time, resonating... And the powerfulness of this, reson this powerful resonation is causing you to feel drawn into it. And that's the way God works too. God designed her path so that you, as you work through it, feel more and more drawn to it. And it's just beautiful the way God's designed the path. So there's your destinies. That's totally different to your fate. Can I define your fate? 
as the things that are going to happen to you on this path. <laughs> and I'm talking about whether you choose one or the other destiny, there are going to be things that happen to you. And there are going to be things that happen to you that are totally beyond your own control. And this is something that the majority of us don't want to believe. We want to believe that everything is in our control. But the reality actually is emotionally that there is actually very little in your control in some ways. And I'll illustrate how that is the case. And there's a lot of emotions here you'll need to feel about this issue. I'm just going to have a cough to so clear my throat. <coughs> okay. Here's you. Let's say this is me, so I'll draw the nail. Every single thing that happens in the universe is affected by my soul condition. Every single thing that happens in the universe is affected by my soul condition. So here's my soul wrapping around my bodies. And my soul contains a whole group of emotions, a whole group of beliefs. These are all inside of me as passions and desires, emotions, feelings, longings. And inside of my soul, this is the real me, my soul, this, some of them are harmonious with love. Some of these passions and desires and longings are harmonious with love. And some of them are in direct contradiction with love. Right? Harmonious with fear, shall we say, or untruth. And inside of my soul, right at the moment, there exists a combination, sometimes we feel it's a menagerie, of emotions and feelings and desires and passions and belief systems and so forth inside of my soul, some of which are in direct contradiction to love, and others which are very much harmonious with love. That's coming out of me right now. Right now, there's what, probably 200 of us here right now, and coming out of each one of us is this soul condition. And that, your soul condition, actually affects absolutely everything in the universe. So you know that belief system that you're holding on to about men that we were talking about earlier, you ladies? That's affecting every single person in the universe in some way. It's not just affecting you. And even just little beliefs, like uh, what's good and what's bad, affects every single person in this universe. So here I am, and there's a, I've got my own soul condition. So here Somehow I just offline. So sometimes I go offline. <laughs> so this is my soul condition. And I'm there sitting in my soul condition. Now, one single person in their soul condition often is addicted to self reliance and using their own free will in the manner in which they want to use it. So, in other words, I've got a group of emotions in me. Let's say one of those emotions is, I'm very angry with the way men have treated me. That's one of my emotions. <clears throat> and if I don't want to deal with that emotion, I'll be addicted to working through to this anger. I'll be addicted to the rage. Right? And this rage is going out of me and creating, not just in me, but in other people around me, all sorts of effects. Now, obviously, to the largest extent, it's creating it in my children, if they're living at home with me. But, to any degree, it's creating it in every single person. My feelings right now are affecting you. Right now. Your feelings are affecting me. Right now. Right. So here's my soul condition. And here's a group of uh, people, let's say these are all the people who have been listening to the divine truth. And then there's all the groups of people who think they've been listening to the divine truth <laughs> and who think they're, they're 
following the divine truth, but they're not. Then there's all the people who think they have the truth. Lots of different religions, isn't it? And all of their people all feel different set of emotions as well. So now we've got these are the ones who are following divine truth. These are the ones who think they're following divine truth. They think divine truth. Then there's these are the ones who think they have truth, but still not being truth. Then there's these ones who know they're in error and are perfectly happy with it. <laughs> then there's the ones who are who know they have error and they're very unhappy in it. And can you see we can keep going on and on and on and on, can't we? Of all these different beliefs and all these different emotions and all these different feelings and everything else. So I'm, I'm there, um, I think it was Tuesday morning, feeling how not only does this, this is not only just a truth, but every single one of those persons um, affects my life. And then not only that, I started remembering um, how to actually predict what my life was going to be as a result of everyone's condition. So what I've been ha what's been happening for me is every morning I'm waking up feeling what's going to happen in the future of my life based on the emotional condition of everyone around me. You see, what happens is when you reach at one moment with God... In other words, when you're in the eight sphere condition, in that state, your actions are always loving. So what happens to you that's unloving is not determined by you anymore. Can you see that? When you're in a state where you are always loving, what happens to you that's unloving is not the result of your law of attraction anymore. Do you follow me? It's the result of everyone else's law of attraction and you being in a loving, in a loving state. Because when you're in a loving state, you will no longer affect or impede any one of those people. So when I'm in a perfectly loving state, I won't affect those people in an unloving way anymore. And I won't affect those people in an unloving way anymore. And I won't affect those people in an unloving way anymore. So how can I create any negative thing for them? I can't. Does that make sense? And I won't affect any of these people in an unloving way anymore. But the truth is also that all of those people may still be in a state of being unloving. And they can certainly affect me in an unloving manner. Well, of course they can. They're allowed to make choices and decisions just like I am. And if we're both living in the world today, any choice or decision they make that's unloving, I'm going to be affected by. Does that make sense to everyone? So I'm there feeling about that. And realising that because of this, every single spirit in the spirit world who's at one with God can predict our futures right at this moment. They can tell whether you're going to die tomorrow with a car accident, whether you're going to fall off the ledge or you're going to you know, break up with your married partner. Or yes. The reason why they can predict it is because unless our emotion changes, the outcome is certain. I'll say that again to you. It's really important to understand. Unless the emotion of all the people involved in my law of attraction, which happens to be everyone in the universe, right? unless the emotions change and become loving, right? and that, if they become loving, then I will only be affected lovingly. But unless that happens, whatever happens, if they don't change their emotions... Then, then whatever happens in the future becomes certain. I can now predict to a high degree of certainty what will happen in the future. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. And I can predict it with a high degree of certainty only with people who are stagnant emotionally. Yeah. Right? So if I've got a group of people who are changing every day emotionally and I, I can actually only predict it on a day-by-day-by-day -by -day -by -day basis... Because every day is going to be different, isn't it? 
if they change emotionally in a positive direction and become more loving, then obviously the outcome for me is going to become more loving. If they change in the opposite direction emotionally, which is possible on the planet, is it not? And become more unloving, then obviously the outcome for me is going to become more unloving. So I'm sitting there with this and um, every morning realising that I'm waking up with a prediction of my own future. Right? So based on what's happening with all of these different people and all of the soul conditions I can feel of everyone involved on the planet of what's going on, I actually know what's going to happen to me. So in the first century, um, once I got to that realisation, um, I realised that I would die before I was an old man. So I realised that I would actually pass and, and once I uh, met my soulmate, I realised that I'd pass within three years. Does that make sense? And I knew it with a certainty. And so much so that actually I would meet people and know that those persons would actually have a part to play in my passing. Right? So in other words, because there weren't many people changing emotionally, the outcome was certain. Right? So you just imagine now for a moment that you could feel everyone's emotions and you could feel your own soul condition, everyone's soul condition interacting with you and every day now you wake up knowing for certain what's going to happen and how far away it is. And not just what's going to happen, but also how it's going to happen because of the soul condition of the people involved. Does that make sense? And it w so while I was feeling this uh, the other day, just remembering all of this from the first century, but also feeling it for now. And what I was feeling was that I was going to die in three years' time that morning. So I had a lot of... Emotions come up about that. Um, I had emotions about um, feeling like, what's the point in coming here if I was going to die in three years' time and things like that. And had some anger-based emotions come up. Remember that this is just a snapshot in time. Do, do you understand? It's only in that moment. So with the emotions that were being dealt with in that moment on the planet, and the emotions that were being stagnant in that moment on the planet, I knew how I would die and where I would die and what would happen. And I, and I had to come to terms with that emotionally. Does that make sense? I had to come to terms with the emotion of that. And so I was just feeling about... Uh, there's just all this awareness of how I was going to die and where I was going to die and what was going to happen and you know, whether I'd be with someone or be alone and all those kind of things. And in the process of feeling all of that, I realised that unless the emotions of people change, that outcome was a certainty. And that's fate. You see, I don't have control of that. No matter how much I deal with my own emotion, I don't have control of that snapshot in time. And this is how spirits can predict to you what will happen in your future because they can see what emotions you're resisting and they can see the emotions of the people around you and what emotions they're resisting and they can see the effect of those emotions on your soul and on the events that are going to control your life and right in that moment they can see what's going to happen to you for certain unless something changes now the irony is of course that something always does change but the problem with the planet is this. The problem in the planet is while many of us desire to change, many of us at the same time desire to not deal with our emotions. So while we have a desire to actually change our life, right at the same time 
We don't want it to be an emotionally difficult experience. What we want is for it to be a nice, easy, smooth flowing, relaxing experience. Does that make sense? Isn't it? That's what we want. But the irony of that is the earth goes through this cycle where people change a bit and then they get to the points that are the most difficult points in their progress. And remember I said earlier one of the most difficult points in your progress was going to be the issues of mother, dealing with mother stuff. That's a very difficult part in your progression. And what happens in that point individually is people reach this plateau, they become quite blocked emotionally towards those groups of emotions. Now at that state, can you see they have two choices? They have a choice to continue working emotionally on the divine love path and eventually, and at this point they don't believe they're going to get through them generally, but eventually, hopefully get through them, or they have a point to just throw it all away. Many decide to throw it all away. Huh? And when they decide to throw it away, their own condition, of course, generally goes back, usually, to the place in which it began. Sometimes it even goes worse than that because of their rage and resentment about the place when they got to this point. Does that make sense? In other words, they get to the point where they're confronted emotionally. And they get so angry and frustrated and you know, annoyed about this, annoyed with God, annoyed with... They just don't want to have a relationship with God ever again. And they go into this space of rage and resentment and whammo. And before you know it, they're back down into the depths of rage. And, and then they get to the point where oh, they don't want to feel that anymore. And what they do generally is they start getting themselves out of that and they come back up to some kind of equilibrium. And a person who decides to not deal with their stuff on earth eventually gets to a point where they're quite fixed in all of their condition. They're quite fixed with their belief systems, they're quite fixed with their emotions, their emotional responses to the same situations are exactly the same every single time, they don't want to change, very resistive to change, very resistive to any change around them, they construct a life where they, and they, they don't want other people to change and they project that out as well and that creates more of a momentum that nobody else changes either and before you know it you've got a whole world of people not changing. Which means that you've got a whole world, the majority of the whole world is in this space of stagnant condition. Right? And if we're in a stagnant condition can you see all of a sudden what God designed to be an unpredictable universe that, that is quite, uh, you know, that we continuously grow on this beautiful path becomes this stagnant and loving condition that creates all of the ills of the world. Does that make sense? Every emotion I hang on to inside of myself creates pain for another person. That's my fate. While I hold on to the emotion, I am going to be stagnant and my fate is determined from that moment. The only time you really have free will is when you choose to release the emotions from you that create the stagnant events and then you continue to progress on the divine love path. If you don't choose to do that, you will at some point stagnate. And when you stagnate, you add to the stagnant condition of the world and you create its ill. So, so if I'm an angry woman, for example, as I was bringing out in the previous discussion, and I sit on my anger and rage, I am actually going to create so many unloving events that later down the track, the law of compensation will call to me to deal with as a result of my lack of desire to deal with my own unloving condition. Does that make sense? That's what happens. And in that state, not only am I affecting my own life, but I'm affecting every single person's life on this planet. And every single person's life in the spirit world to a lesser degree because of their removal from the planet. Right? But I'm still affecting them in some way. 
Right at the moment, there are celestial spirits who are being affected by your choices, negative choices that you're making. Now, they don't have an unloving response to it, but they are still affected. Right? What do you think happens when you get into a place of resistance and then you tell five of your friends, all of whom are guided with celestial spirits? Don't you think their workload ramps up? What are, so while you, when you're running around telling your friends that something that makes you angry, the celestial spirits are on the opposite end trying to say, no, 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 don't go with this anger and rage, go into the underlying emotion, don't connect with them, you know what I mean? Their work is being affected by your choice. Can you see that? Can you see the relationship? And right at the moment, your choices result in my death. My choices too, of course. All right? as a snapshot in time. Now, I'm not saying any of these things to make you feel guilty or anything. I'm just illustrating to you that we are connected. We are connected to each other. Your choice to avoid doesn't just affect you. It affects everyone else in this room. It affects everyone else in Australia. It affects everyone else on the planet. Can you see that your choice to not own your own stuff is a highly choice. Can you see that? And I'm fluctuating again, aren't I? <laughs> now, because of that, your fate and mine are determined. And unless we change, our fate becomes fixed. So for some of you who are remaining unchangeable inside of your soul, you might, there might be celestial spirits or other spirits now who know right now that in three years' time on the M1 you're going to die from a car accident just because of all the choices that you're going to make that will end you up in that condition. Does that make sense? And they know that when you pass in the spirit world after the car accident that you'll stay in the hills for a period of 25 years. Right at the moment, they know that. And unless your emotion changes, they know that for certain. Right? And I don't mean unless your emotion just changes. I mean unless the emotions of every single person around you change as well. Can you see, your life isn't actually under your full control. Your life is actually under the control of all of us. And you can see this happening in the world today, can you not? Millions of people get affected every single day by the choices of one person. Millions of people get affected on the other side of the world from our choices here in Australia. Millions of people be affected. Now we can see that in war and other situations like that, but even in our choice of what we eat and our choice of what we wear and our choice of what we do with our life is all affecting every single person around us. Right? Now, I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty. I'm saying this to help you be aware. Do you follow me? Because if you're aware, then you can start asking yourself, do I want to make these choices anymore? Or do I want to start making real change? And it's not intellectual choice that makes a difference here. It is soul-based changes that make a difference. So you can intellectually pray all you like for the safety of this planet and at the same time hold on to a group of emotions that are destroying the planet right at the same moment. Right? You can do that. And what we need to do is change that. And so what I, what I did was I woke up this morning and just grieved the fact that I was going to die in three years' time. That morning. And I'm starting to realise that actually every morning is different. I wake up some mornings and I know I'm going to live a long life here on earth based on the emotions that are getting dealt with, not only by myself but everyone around me. Other moments I feel your stagnation and I feel you close down and I feel your resistance and, and when you get into those places and not only you, I'm not talking about you as a group of people, I mean you as the whole world get into that place, I can feel what's going to happen to me. And every day is different. So every day I've got a different emotion or response to knowing the truth about what will happen. Does that make sense? So, 
And this is one thing that's been affecting my eyesight because I haven't wanted to feel the truth about my future. Right? Sorry, yeah. So, so, so I haven't wanted to feel the truth about my future and because for the majority of the times I know that within three years I'm going to be dead. And actually, up until recently, the majority of times I knew I'd be dead and alone. In other words, not with my soulmate or anything like that. And so I wake up in the morning with just, just this feeling of being overwhelmed by those emotions. And what I'm realising is that it's helping me a lot, actually, to, to just let the emotions go of desiring control. Does that make sense to you? Like letting go of the control. You see, you see, one of the main problems we have and one of the main reasons for our anger is that we want to control events, circumstances and people around us in order to make us happy. Right? That's what we want to do. And in the process, we're actually denying one major truth and that is I don't have complete control over my life. Right? I don't have complete control over my life. That's a difference than actually being in complete free will. There's a complete difference between those two states. Right? And when I say complete control, what's controlling my life is actually not only my own soul condition, but the soul condition of every individual around me. And when I begin to understand that, I start seeing the importance of me changing my own soul condition. Because the only person of all of the people here in this room that I can change the soul condition of is me. So as I change my own soul condition, I will get into a place where I no longer worry about your control of me and your control of my life. In the first century what happened to me when I realised these things, part of me coming to a remember, remembrance of these things is remembering the events that surrounding my own death in the first century. And, and part of uh, going through this emotionally was coming to terms with the fact, and I can remember the process then of coming to terms with the fact that I was going to die. And every day waking up with the same feeling. Imagine every day waking up with the same knowing, yes, it's going to be then, it's going to be then, it's going to be... Every day at getting one day closer, one day closer. Every day, because of the soul condition of the people around you not changing, my soul condition was at one with God at this point, so it was totally based around the soul condition of the people around me not changing that these events were going to occur. And it was totally based on my own law of attraction they would occur, of course, too, because I wasn't going to give up the truth even if nobody else wanted it. Right? And so what happened was people made some changes to a degree and then they got to the hard emotions. And when they got to the hard emotions, they didn't want to make any more changes. So I had whole groups of men surrounding me who believed that I was... They, they were fascinated by the divine truth, just as many of you are, but they had a deep feeling that I was highly delusional, which many of you, by the way, do have. <laughs> and, and as a result of this feeling that I was de delusional, they planned my life for me. Huh? Because they had this feeling of condescension towards me that they knew better about my life than I did because I was delusional. <laughs> they thought they could then plan my life for me. So what they started to do was set up meetings and events around me that caused more... The, it caused the... the uh, what do you... Um, where two things are in opposition to each other, the friction between, between myself and the Pharisees and Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and myself and the Roman army and so forth. And in their knowing better than I knew, in their opinion, they decided to set up my friends. These are my friends, just like many of you are my friends. They decided to set up things 
without me knowing things that I'd have to then deal with in my life. And I knew when those events occurred, who had created them. And it, they were out of my control. Does that make sense? I was the only person who was in a state of love in that event. And so for, therefore, the event became out of my control. I would have to continue to act lovingly, no matter how unlovingly everyone around me was. Right? And so what happened was, many of them started fabricating things about me and my life. Many of them started fabricating things in terms of like events and creating events that I would be confronted in. They felt they were doing it for my benefit and for the benefit of others. So they started feeling like they wanted to make me a ruler, for example. So they started doing behind the scenes political negotiations with people in order to help me become the ruler. Right? They started criticising all of my interactions with females and started gr creating all of these different things that started occurring, all of these different friction-based events that started occurring between myself and others. And as they ramped that up, my life became even less in my own control. Can you see why? Because I, I was going to act lovingly in every situation and lovingly acting in some situations is only one thing you can do. Does that make sense to you? Sometimes there's only one thing you can do that's loving. And so um, it got to the point where I knew that at some point shortly I would die and myself and Mary would discuss this very frequently. Because obviously by this stage Mary was in love with me and she could feel that I was going to die as well. And, uh, and she started having to process quite a lot of emotions about my imminent departure. And even though that was the case, no matter what I said to other people, they still wanted to keep doing what they were doing. Right? And in the end, that's what created my death. And in the end, that's what's going to create yours. Right? Every time, no, it's not just you don't grow. Every time you and everyone around you doesn't grow, eventually unloving things will happen to you. And at some point, you're going to have to come to some kind of dealing with that emotionally. That actually, your life is not completely in your own control. You're going to have to deal with that emotionally at some point. Because there will become a time when you maybe will become at one with God too. And in that space, you will confront a lot of people who don't want to be at one with God, and a lot of people who want to be happy in their error. And you will, with the truth that's in you, confront the error in others. And eventually, your life will be just a reflection of divine love coming through you. It doesn't mean your life will be in your control. And you know what? You won't care. You won't care. You won't care that it's now out of your control. And can you see that every time I have the emotion, someone's controlling me, you really don't know what you're saying. Because the truth is they are controlling you, just not often in the way you think. Right? And the truth is that you're, if you're upset about it, then you haven't worked through an emotion yet because at the end of the day, these people will continue to control you. The only time a person will not control you or attempt to control you is when they themselves become at one with God. That's the only time they won't be able to control you anymore. Right? So that means if you're going to be the first group of people that become at one with God on this planet, then that also is going to mean that you're also going to be the first group of people who relinquish control. In other words, you won't care about your fate because you know your destiny. Right? 
So your fate may be that somebody kills you because of your relationship with God. Your fate may be that somebody tortures you because of your relationship with God. Straighten myself up a bit. And that being the case, you will need to give up control. So all this addiction we have to control is actually about trying to control our fate. And in reality, our fate is out of our control. The reason why our fate is out of our control is because everyone around me has an effect on my life. So therefore my fate is out of my control. But my destiny, I can completely control. Can you see that? My destiny, either one path or the other, I can completely control. In fact, I do completely control. Right. So, so every time a group of us becomes stagnate emotionally, every time I as an individual want to hold on to a specific belief or want to hold on to a specific emotion inside of me that I don't want to feel, want to hold on, every time I do that, I am creating a certain fate, not only for myself, but also for someone else. Which is really a very unloving act, if you think about it, isn't it? Can you see that? It's a very unloving act to do that. So the beauty of knowing the truth of this um, for me has been I've had to deal with quite a lot of grief that actually while my destiny is completely under my own control and is a certainty whatever I choose depending on what I choose my fate is an uncertain outcome. So I don't know whether I'm going to be successful in what I decided to do when, before I came here. I don't know that I'm going to be successful in demonstrating to you the soulmate relationship in its purity because that requires two people who are dealing with their emotions, not just me. I don't know whether I'm going to survive this process. No, I've got no idea. And while I've got no idea, that means it's good because people are changing. <laughs> Does that make sense? In other words, there's people on the planet changing in positive direction. Uh, I will have no idea. Right? But as soon as things stop changing in a positive direction, from that moment on my fate is certain. Yeah. And the fate of many or so is going to be certain for the same reason. I'm just going to have to change the battery, I think, here. Now, the reason why I bring all this up with you is that many of you are worried about the outcome of you following the divine love path. Right? Many of you are worried about losing friends, losing relatives. Many of you are worried sometimes about even your life, the amount of anger that you get directed at you by others. Many of you are worried about your, fam your family situation, your, your marriages, your partnerships and all these other things. Now, the only thing you need to remember is while you hold on to stagnant emotions, the fate of every one of those things is certain. The only way it's not going to be certain and, mo and be more towards your destiny is if you actually deal and release the emotions that your fate stops being certain then and becomes totally undefined. Totally under, in a way, the lack of control brings you control, almost. That's really how it is. And so what I found myself emotionally is I had to deal with the, now that I can feel everyone's fate, uh, based on the emotional conditions of the snapshot that's happening at the time, um, it's been quite confronting, firstly for me personally, um, because when 
I hang on to certain emotions and everyone else hangs on to certain emotions, what happens is my fate becomes very definite. Right? And the morning I woke up, my fate was going to be that I'd be bashed to death in my own home. That was my fate. Right? And I knew around the timing it would occur. And I knew that I wouldn't be with Mary. And um, I knew I'd be alone. I knew the majority of you would have um, rejected this divine truth by that point. That was the morning I woke up. Okay. The next morning I woke up <laughs> and myself and Mary had dealt with quite a lot of different emotions in that time. And many of you had started dealing with some emotions as well and many of the people in the world have shifted in emotionally just through this shift that I'd made myself as well. And as a result of that, my fate felt different that day. Does that make sense? But my, what I'm finding is every morning now I wake up and I just try to tune into what my fate is for that day. And some days it's quite distressing. And I just deal with that emotionally. And I've worked out that actually um, the more I deal with that emotionally, the faster I'm going to progress. Yeah. And eventually I get to the point where I'm at one with God and my fate will still be either certain or uncertain depending on the stagnant condition of others. Does that make sense? And this is what will happen with every one of you too. You'll feel that as well. There are going to be moments where you wake up in the morning and you say, this relationship's not going to last to the end of the day that I'm in. If we both hold on to the same emotions we've got this morning. And then throughout the day, one or both of you will change your emotions in the relationship and all of a sudden you'll feel, wow, I don't feel that anymore because your fate has now changed. Does that make sense? It only changes by the emotion changing. That's the only way it changes, by the soul. Remember I said it's the soul condition that must change. The problem that's been on the planet for many centuries is the soul condition of mankind has only very gradually been improving. Just very gradually. Because of that, communications with spirits has resulted in the fact that every time you communicate with a spirit, a spirit could tell you with a large degree of certainty about what is going to happen in your future and in the future of others around you. Now the truth is that that is becoming more unpredictable. Many of you, for example, are now changing quite a lot emotionally. And because of the changes that you make emotionally, the, the, the future of this planet is becoming more and more unpredictable. And it's becoming better. You know? So rather than it being predictable of what will occur in the future, Every single day it's difficult to predict what will happen in the future now because so many people are making changes. And that's a great thing, right? to actually not know what the future is going to be. Because, because if you do know, it means everyone is stagnant. And if it means everyone is stagnant, the future of fate is certain. Can you see that? Right. So this is why it's so important to actually think about the two aspects. Now... Can I just make one more comment? And that is that destiny, if you hold on to your desired destiny, your fate is always going to be uncertain. And if you hold on to staying in the same place you currently are, your fate is going to be certain. Now, did that make any sense to you? <laughs> because, because what's happening is while I, if I hold on to a destiny, let's say, I, let's say even I'm on the natural love path and I know the path I'm on. I'm on the natural love path. I know how to progress. I know how to change at the soul level. I know how to make changes. So let's say I know this. I can feel this inside of me. While I'm changing, my destiny is... Remember I said at the beginning, my destiny is always certain. 
While I'm changing, though, my fate is uncertain in that tomorrow I might not die, even though today I might think it. Because if I'm changing emotionally and I'm changing in my, my soul condition, different attractions are going to happen at every single moment. <laughs> but the danger of stagnation is I am no longer changing my soul condition. I am now not only adding to the certainty of my own destiny, but also adding to the certainty of the destiny of people around, sorry, not the certainty of my destiny, the certainty of my fate, but, but also the certainty of the fate of the people around me. I am actually, because we are linked like this, affecting you. If I don't change, all of you will be affected by my lack of change. Every one of you will be affected by that. If I change, I reduce the effect. If I change positively, I reduce the effect of, the of my soul condition on you. And if I change negatively, I increase the effect of my soul condition, negative emotions, on you. That's the result. So I'm not just affecting myself, am I? I'm affecting you too. What I choose is affecting and changing what is your fate, what is going to be your outcome. Now, in the long run, I only still have the same two destinies. I either will be perfected in natural love or I will become the perfect divine angel. One of the two things will happen based on my choices. Right? But in the interim, the amount of pain that I and others experience as a result of my choices is going to greatly depend upon my desire to hold on to stagnation and hold on to emotions or release them. I am creating your pain every time I hold on to one of my emotions. And you are creating mine every time you hold on to one of yours. Does that make sense? You are causing pain in the world. Now obviously when you get to be at one with God, the pain that's coming to you from the world has no effect on you emotionally. But until that point, it does have an effect on you emotionally, does it not? Right? But once you become at one with God, it no longer has an effect on you emotionally. You can walk through your life then in total fearlessness and confidence that even if someone comes up and shoots you, you are not going to have a painful existence. And once that emotion is released from you where you believe you will have pain, that emotion is completely gone. What will happen from that moment onwards is you'll be able to live in complete fearlessness with every choice and every decision and everything that you choose to do. And ironically, at that same point in time is exactly the same point in time that nobody around you will ever be affected negatively from one of your choices. Now that doesn't believe that they don't believe they'll be affected negatively. Because many people, when you tell them the truth, think that you've just affected them negatively. I mean, from God's perspective, you're not affecting them negatively from that moment. And you will know that you're not. You will know in that moment that you're not. So um, what happens too is that uh, what's happening with regard to mediumship is that it's becoming more and more unpredictable. If you're looking to foretell events through mediumship, because of the changes that are happening on the planet and the changes that you personally make inside of your soul and the emotions you personally release, what happens is that the future is a lot less predictable. And since it's a lot less predictable, you'll go to a medium and you'll, you'll get the medium channel of spirit about, you know, talking about your life and some of those things won't happen because of the soul changes that are occurring, not only in your life, but in the lives of those around you. Right? And that's what will happen. Carol, you got a question? Um, AJ, where does um, desire fit into this? If you have a desire in amongst all that, where does it... A desire for what though, Carol? Um... Well, in, in my case... What's your desire? My case? Yeah. Um, a desire to change my life and the way that I live and where I live. Yeah. 
And what are your desires? Are they in harmony? Do you want to bring your desire into more harmony with divine love? Or do you I want feel, to... I feel it is in... I feel it's a really pure desire. I've really looked at it for a long time. And are you talking specifically about the desire to get rid of your property? Or are you talking um, specifically <laughs> about your desire to live in harmony with divine love? Um, I'm t talking about living... Well, I'm talking about loving myself enough to li leave my property and live live differently live yeah live live what i think is a pure desire to live in harmony with divine love all right is it is it happening no <laughs> no okay so so let's look at this what is your destiny um divine love path I, well uh, my destiny is I want to follow the divine love path. So you're telling me that you're dealing with every single emotion that comes up for you. You're going into the causal emotion of every single one of those things. Well, I'm working on it, AJ. No, I'm no. I'm trying. I, See, I, I, <laughs> I asked you a specific question and you're giving me a furphy answer. Well, um, I, that is why I want to change the way that I live because... You know, I'm really busy and I, I, there's a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. And that's why I want to do Mary's workshop. <laughs> no, you see, can you see what you just said? You said, yeah. I'm going to follow my desires the way I, the, the desire to, to have one destiny, this desire for the destiny of, to be the divine angel, right? Yeah. But I'm only going to do that once I sell my property. <laughs> sell property is an essential part of me following this, this, this... No, I don't think I'm saying that. I think I'm saying that I'm following it as closely as I can. Do you know how now. frequently I've discussed this issue no, with you? I know, and I didn't want to bring that up. I just wanted to ask you about... <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about desire. I know, but I'm going to reflect <laughs> it back anyway. We've now had two years of conversations about the same mm. issue, mm. and I keep giving you the same answer. Mm. And you don't want that answer. I don't understand the answer. Either. No, no, you don't even want the answer. Oh. See, see, when you want an answer, you will understand it. You don't even want the answer. Mm -hmm. You don't want to live in harmony with your desire to be the divine angel right now. Let me show you some of the reasons why. Mm -hmm. Can I show you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you want to sell your property for a certain price, don't mm -hmm. you? Yeah. Okay, there's one reason why. Because you're not willing to compromise on that price for the sake of your divine angel destiny. Well, I am. I am prepared to compromise on the price. <laughs> no, you're not. Oh. Yeah, if, you, if you put it on the market for $1,000 today, I'm pretty certain you'd sell it. <laughs> <laughs> How many buyers at $1,000? <laughs> Quite a few. <laughs> I can guarantee a sale at $1,000. Now, how many buyers at ten thousand dollars? <laughs> You're definitely going to get ten thousand. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> now, yeah, and that's the point, Carol. Yeah. The point is that while you have a compromise on that emotional issue, are you in harmony with God's love? Are willing to compromise your soul for a million dollars? Well, I'd have to live at the bank if I didn't get that. <laughs> You'd be what's called bankrupt if you didn't yeah. get it. And that'd be fine. Oh, okay. There's nothing much you can do about it and you're not going to die. Okay. Well, maybe I'm not on the divine love path. <laughs> <laughs> can you see how you're willing to compromise your destiny and this is now controlling your fate? The way it controls your fate is you're unwilling to shift the emotional reason why you're willing to compromise on your soul. You're willing to compromise on your soul at the moment. See, you're saying you're busy. There's an answer to that. Stop being busy. Mm. That's the answer to that. And then you say, but I won't get the money in to pay for the property then. Yeah, that's okay. Let it happen. You see what happens when you honour your soul. See, at the moment, you are not honouring your soul. Right? Can you say you're on the divine love path if you're not honouring your soul? Obviously not. Not really, hey. Mm. So I'm not honouring my soul. I'm willing to sacrifice a price, right? And I'm willing to, and that price is more important than the price of my soul. Mm. And that's a, don't you think that's a major issue of love that you need to learn for yourself? Yeah. How important is your own soul? 
your, your own soul is worth millions and millions of dollars. Your own soul is priceless. Mm. So, so if it was me in your situation, and I've had to do this many times, mm. Carol, in your situation, I would take a loss and even if I had to, go bankrupt just for the sake of my own soul. Mm. If that's yes. what has to happen. Well, it's, if you honour your own soul, that's what you will do. Mm. Like, you would have to do that. At the moment, the market is quite poor, is it not? Yeah. For a property of your size in particular. Yeah. Right? And, and as a result of that, the price is going to be depressed, is it not? Yeah. And you are unwilling to accept a depressed price for your property and you're willing to sacrifice your soul about it. And that's not being on the divine love path. Okay. That's a natural love thing. You're trying to get something happening for, you, for yourself there, not trusting any of God's laws in the process. Mm -hmm. Honour your soul. When you honour your soul, all of God's laws now can operate in harmony with the honour. Mm -hmm. When you dishonour your soul, you're now operating against a myriad of God's soul-based laws. Like There's literally thousands of soul-based laws and every one of them, every time you dishonour your own soul, you're also breaking every one of those laws. And every one of those laws has a consequence. And all you need to do to get over that is to honour your soul. Mm -hmm. You need to work through the emotional reason why you're not honouring it and honour it. Now, if your emotional reason is you want a certain amount of money, what, what's happening for you is you, you want to sell your property at a certain price mm -hmm. and then that price, you want enough profit in that price. <laughs> Did somebody drop something? You want to... After all that, um, there's something wrong with the cable that was on my plug, so I'll speak with a handout. Can you see, though, Carol, uh, getting back to our discussion, um, you were willing to compromise on quite a number of issues with your soul. And while you're willing to compromise, none of God's laws can operate in harmony with you. And I've said this to you on frequent occasions, but you, don't, you feel that you can manoeuvre yourself into a position. Now... You can't do that. Like, your truth is your soul is creating this position. And your soul is creating it to deal with emotions. And if you deal with emotions, things will change. But only if you're willing to not compromise your soul. So, so if you allow yourself to compromise your soul, what's going to happen is that you're going to have to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait for a whole series of circumstances to occur through the lack of compromise on somebody else's soul. And that might be forever. You, you don't know how long that's going to be. So my, my suggestion right now is where do you want to be? So sell where you are for whatever you can get, mm -hmm. right? Lower your expectations, right? It doesn't matter what the property is worth. Do you want to be there or not? And if you don't want to be there, then get rid of the property at a price the bank will accept. <laughs> and when I say at the price the bank will accept, that they'll accept you auctioning it for or whatever else, you know, and just do it for that and then allow your law of attraction to bring to you the life you say you want because desire creates everything. If you truly desired this life, you would already be in it. So the fact is you were willing to compromise your soul at the moment and not be in it, in the life, I mean. So, so the, the, the thing is that you know you have a desire to become this divine angel, right? Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. But your soul, you're also being told that you've got quite a lot of emotions mm. where you're willing to compromise that destiny. Mm. And you need to look at those emotions. I guess I, guess I was just con a bit confused about bringing it back to yourself even, that um, you know, your, where does your desire come in as to where, and your fate, like, um, you know, I'm just a little confused with that. I don't know. Well, if your is. desire is fixed on one thing primarily, this is where you can simplify your life mm -hmm. tremendously. If your desire is just fixed on the growth of your soul towards God, yeah. and that's it, yeah. nothing else, then whatever comes along will be part of opening you up in that destiny, okay. opening up that destiny for you. At the moment, that's not your de primary desire, <laughs> to be frank with you. Your primary desire at the moment is to sell your property and get into another one. That's the desire that you think about every day. Okay. See, it's the things you think about every day that are your desires. Yeah. You follow me? And your desire right now is to sell one property and get into another. 
Now, you're saying it's for your soul. But the truth is you're willing to compromise your soul. Like there's, there's, there's like 200 buyers here for $1,000, for for <laughs> right? So, so, and who knows, you, you know, you might be able to come up with like 100 buyers at $2,000 or 1,000 buyers at $1,000. And before you know it, you've got a cooperative owning your property. <laughs> and, you know, there's all sorts of options here that we reject by our demands upon, uh, upon everyone else and by actually forgetting that our soul is a powerful creator. The truth is when you really want to do this rather than just do it when the circumstances are right, then everything will fall into place for you. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, and and that's you. why, that's, you see, the beauty is, with this truth, the beauty of knowing this truth is that you can focus on your destiny and everything that happens on focusing on the destiny then becomes your fate in terms of dealing with the emotions. All you need to do is deal with the emotions of your fate if you focus on your destiny. Does that make sense? So while I'm focused on the destiny of becoming the divine angel, there's going to be lots of different happen things happen to me, not just because of my own law of attraction, but because of everybody's law of attraction. These things are going to happen. And while those things happen, as long as I own my own emotions about them and deal with the causal emotion inside of myself that they trigger every one of these events, eventually I'll get to the point where I'm no longer worried about my fate and I'm only focused on my destiny. Yeah. That, and this is where we need to have a desire in this direction. Whenever we compromise and we start compromising our, you know, we start telling ourselves lots of stories, hey. Like, oh yeah, I really want God. But, but oh yeah, and you say, all right, you really want God. But are you willing to give up your job if giving up your job would give you, get you closer to God? Oh, how can I do that? I can't do that. I've got to get money. So, so in other words, you're saying, oh, your fear about not getting money is preventing your desire for God. That's correct. It is. And many of us believe that with a certainty. We believe that our job, I can't leave because, and we'll come up with a hundred reasons why. And the truth is that every one of those reasons has an emotional stagnation underneath it that needs to be addressed. And when it's addressed, you'll leave your job and, you'll, and ironically, you'll get exactly what you desire much more frequently that's the truth but we're unwilling you see we're unwilling to give that up and so look at look at this issue for yourself carol look at the issue of your unwillingness on price you want a specific outcome and since you want a specific outcome you're you're willing to completely deny your soul you're willing to be as busy as you are you're willing to be, you know, wait, 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 wait for that price. You're willing to spend months of your life in stagnation waiting for a certain price to come along and you're sacrificing your own soul and you don't realise it. And you need to allow yourself to go, all right, I'm not going to sacrifice my soul anymore. There's been times when I've, I've had to take huge losses of percentage on, a, on, on things that I've gotten rid of just for the sake of my soul. I've given away hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of businesses just for the sake of my soul, right? I've, I've often sold properties at 20%, 30% below their value for the sake of my soul. Yeah. And, and I'm not destitute, <laughs> right? <laughs> Katrina? After hearing your talk and after just doing the workshop with Mary, I'm feeling very, very motivated to release every single thing that's inside of me. So my question is, how many people is it going to take to change your fate and all of our fates along that line? To Why are you even concerned about changing my fate? Well, I was thinking more about... Because I'm okay, not. Good question. Well, I was thinking more about, is there a number of people that collectively who would experience their emotions would have a more loving outcome for the planet in terms of life changes? Ah, yes. So that brings us to the question that I wanted to, to, to address, and that is the question of mass consciousness. What, what they call mass consciousness, shall we say. 
And yes, there is a certain, you see, um, one thing we need to realise when we start changing our emotional condition is that as we progress through the spheres, the power of our soul and its effects on other people are much greater, right? So, so at the moment, my soul is influencing 200 people, at least, because there's 200 people in the audience listening to what I'm saying. Does that make sense? And it's not, no one's asleep just yet. No, so we're pretty much right. So, uh, <laughs> right, so, so right at the moment, you could say the minimum amount of souls that I'm influencing through the changes I'm making are the audience that's here. Does that make sense? Now, now what happens is in the first sphere, and as you grow in love to every sphere or dimension, your influence increases on the numbers of souls you will influence through your condition. So as the irony is as you grow in love, you actually have more power upon everyone, uh, but it's always loving, than you have as you degrade into a condition of hatred, of revenge and fear. So as I'm growing, and, and this is a, the truth is that actually if I'm on the natural love path in the sixth sphere, I might be able to influence a thousand people on the earth if I really focus on it. You look at Ramtha, and when he was on the natural love course here on earth, uh, in the spirit world, and he was affecting people on earth, there's probably 10, 15, 20,000 people he was affecting. So there's a natural love spirit who's affecting, deeply affecting the lives of 20 or 30,000 people on the planet. Right? The others are just listening to what he says and going, yeah, no, but not really changing themselves or acting upon the change. But there's a group. Now, when, when you transist into the seventh sphere in terms of the amount of love coming from your soul, you will affect a hundred times that amount. And then if you, as you go into it one minute, you will affect a thousand times the amount that you had in the seventh sphere. So you will affect millions and millions of people in that place. So, so if you focus on your own development, ironically, that is also the time that you'll be able to change others, not by forcing them into change, but by your soul condition creates change automatically as a result. Does that make sense? So when, when more and more of us go practice more and more love in our lives every single day, it affects hundreds of people around us every day, every day, another hundreds of people. And what happens is they get, can become attracted to us. They come to us as a result of this attraction. And so as we grow, we get to a point where one person can affect thousands of people or tens of thousands or hundred thousands or, or a million people or tens of millions of people. And it goes up exponentially as we grow in divine love. Now, that'll get to a point where maybe, let's say there's a thousand people on the planet who are all growing in divine love and all of those thousand people are not yet at one with God, but they're in the seventh sphere of the spirit world. In other words, they're in the seventh dimension in terms of the amount of love, divine love in their soul. Now, they can affect collectively, they can, they can actually uh, balance out, if you like, effectively, the millions and millions and millions of people's poor condition on the planet. Does that make sense? And, and this is the beauty of us changing and as we grow in love and reflect that love, closer to it one moment we get, the more powerful our soul becomes. And the more of us that practice love and the more of us that practice love, the more of us that allow ourselves to grow in a loving space and release the emotions that cause us to act unlovingly, the less effect the world has on us as a result. Now, it doesn't mean it might not die in the process, but you'll actually feel that's not an effect as well. And the beauty is that you'll, you'll be able to grow and grow and grow. You see, when I say the words, when I said the words to myself even, wow, like I'm going to die in three years' time. I'm going to be beaten to death by a group of angry men who uh, hate me at the moment and I, who I can feel, who are being motivated by a group of angry spirits and I can feel where it's going to happen and everything. While I'm in that place feeling that fate, if you like, um, if I deal with my emotions, I'm automatically growing and automatically changing the potential outcome. Now, now, it gets to the point when you're at one with God that the outcome for yourself now is that you're, you won't change on certain issues. And so 
And so your interaction with others then becomes more certain. Y you will certainly have people angry with you in that place. Right? I, I had thousands of people angry, tens of thousands of people angry with me in the first century when I was at one with God in a place of love. How did that happen? Everybody goes, oh yeah, but Jesus was in this place of love, you know, and everybody just responded to that. I'm sorry, that's not true. Everybody did not respond to that. Like, how many times have you personally been confronted by what I've already said about love or truth? Like, many of you go away from these things feeling quite upset with AJ, right, ranging through to absolute rage with me that I feel for months on end sometimes, right? And, and they are all soul things that are, cha that, that are creating my fate, right? That rage connects with the rage of spirits and that connects with other people's rage. And before you know it, you've got all these, these linked up mechanisms creating a certain outcome. But as you personally grow in love and own your own emotions and no longer stay in a state of anger, then what happens is the fate changes for not only you, but everyone around you automatically. So my suggestion is forget about trying to change my fate. I already know my destiny. Right? Forget about trying to change my fate and forget about trying to change your own. Because because you may die too in this process. May, there may be angry people with you who are so angry that want to kill you too. And it, and I said that in the first century to all of the followers. I said if you want to follow the divine love path at some point in the future, they may come and kill you in my name, in, and I even do it in my name. Right? And they'll do it because of you being, just being linked to me. Right? So people may actually finish up attacking me and killing me and then deciding to kill everyone who knows me. That might be our fate. Right? But it's certainly not our destiny. Our destiny, if we focus on this as our destiny, then we will always going to become at one with God in the end. We're, we're always going to get there. We're, we're going to put our soul first, our desires for that first. Everything else becomes secondary. And we will put our focus on our relationship with our soulmate next and everything else becomes secondary to that. So every blockage I have towards Mary becomes my highest priority in my life to deal with. It doesn't matter, you know, if we're skin in, my, uh, um, in terms of not having any money. It doesn't matter what demands I have, whether there's a whether there's a, one of these sessions going on or something. I just cancel all of those and focus on my relationship with Mary. That's my second highest priority. My highest priority is my relationship with God. And I know that while I heal my relationship with Mary, I'm automatically also healing my relationship with God. So those two things, as Mary knows, has been have been my only passions and desires nothing else matters to me literally like it doesn't matter to me even these sessions don't matter to me as much as those two things because in the end if I become at one with God that's going to have the greater effect on humanity and a greater effect on you and your faith and your desire than anything I could ever say to you and anything I could ever do for you and and once I become at one with my soulmate, that's going to have a greater effect on every one of you in terms of illustrating how close you can be together as partners and how wonderful that and joyous that relationship can be. That's going to once we do that, if we both desire to do it, and it requires that both of our desires, once we do that and demonstrate that, we will be in a place of really supreme happiness, but you'll see what a soulmate relationship God designed it to be. You will automatically see that. No matter what, I, I can talk to you for months about the soulmate relationship and until you see it happening between myself and Mary, you are not going to be fully convinced that it's possible. Can you see that? And this is the truth inside of your own life too. You can speak to months and months and months and months to people about spirit influence and this and that and all other things that you might have been talking to people about. But at the end of the day, unless they see the change in you, it's not going to be real. It's not going to be real for them. And when they see and feel the change in you, they will be drawn to you. Automatically. They will automatically be drawn to you. Some to attack you, but a lot to listen, and a lot will be drawn to listen and to take in the knowledge. So, like, we don't advertise these sessions. Like, there's no advertising going on, you know, out there on the 
television or the radio or all of those kind of things, but a couple of hundred people come along every time because the law of attraction is perfect in its operation. So, so, but the truth is that once, a number of, once enough of us get to a certain condition of love, the effect that that has on the planet is cancelling out literally millions and millions and millions of negative people. And in the process of that, there can be major adjustments and changes as a result that shift markedly. Even what happens on the earth can shift markedly as a result. Do you mean if we stay in our physical form in that state? Or does it not matter, spiritual, spirit form or physical form? Um, it certainly matters. Le it doesn't matter. But the truth is that the dimension of existence that we exist in has the greatest effect of whatever our emotions are. So if I'm living in the physical dimension, then it's going to be the physical dimension that has the greatest effect by me becoming more and more harmonious with love. If I'm living in the spirit dimensions, then the physical affection is going to be less affected, but it's still going to be affected by my growth in love. You think of how many first fear spirits, if all of them decided they were never going to project at another human again, you imagine how many of you would be in anger half the time? Because a lot of our anger is totally affected by spirits, like but connecting to our hooks and where we go. You imagine if every one of those spirits just decided for a moment, I'm going to live in love and I'm never going to get one of my addictions met from the earth again. So they're in the first fear, but that would have a huge effect, wouldn't it? on every single person on this planet. And so what happens is once the mass consciousness reaches a certain level, and if we call it, let's, call it, let's not call it mass consciousness anymore. Because, because the truth is that that term tends to indicate the minds involved. Let's call it this, the mass soul condition. In other words, the real condition inside of the soul of every individual. Once the real condition inside of the soul changes, there are huge changes on this planet. Huge changes can happen. Just by one or two people getting into this place of, of removing things from their soul. So once, once, for example, the first woman on the planet gets into, on the divine love path, gets into this space where she is totally open towards her soulmate, what's going to happen is the next women on the planet who are on the divine love path are going to find themselves crying a lot about soulmate issues automatically because that creates the automatic openness. You, you know that it's like that. If you're sitting down with a person who's really resistive and angry and upset and every time you cry they tell you to shut up, Oh, that sounds like my mum, was it? No, but, and, <laughs> every time they cry, they, you know, my mum wasn't like that, but every time you, they, you cry, they tell you to shut up. Every time, you know, you say something that they don't believe in, they tell you to get lost and, you know what I mean? Of course, it's very hard in that place for you to change, right? Now, imagine you're the person who's now totally open. People say things to you and you don't get upset anymore. There's no soul reaction to their, what they're saying that's negative anymore. It's just love. It's openness. Imagine what that feels like. Many of you feel really comfortable expressing your emotions to me, right? Will you imagine that every single person of your acquaintance feels really comfortable expressing their emotions to you and you don't react out of harmony with love with every one of those expressions? They can be yelling and screaming at you, you know, all the, and you're still in harmony with love. Can you imagine in that place how powerful effect that would have on your friends? Wouldn't they feel drawn to that? Of course. And wouldn't that then affect their friends? And, and so it goes down the chain. Eventually that's what needs to happen on the earth. So while I bring up this issue of fate and destiny, what I'm trying to do is focus you on your destiny and, and focus you on the fact that you can have a passionate desire for that destiny. And if you have a passionate desire for that destiny, as Mary has said to many people in the workshops, as long as you have a passionate desire for that destiny, that destiny will draw out of you every emotional error and baggage that you have that confronts that destiny. It will automatically happen as long as you have a passionate desire for that destiny. As soon as you start compromising your soul and compromising that destiny because you're worried about your fate, 
because you're worried that oh, I might not sell my house tomorrow, I might not have enough food tomorrow, I might not have enough to drink tomorrow, I might, we might be in the wrong location at the wrong time and get hurt tomorrow. And once we start worrying about our fate, we are now not focused on our destiny. And now many negative things will happen to our soul because our soul is unwilling to release the results of its creation. And we need to see that. Darling? I just wanted to add to that. Oh, that um, you want to join me? Yes. Just AJ was talking about the mass soul condition. And um, for all of you who've been in the workshops with me, I always emphasise... Um, I don't mind as long as you, if you're looking at a block and you're feeling that, if you're recognizing, wow, this is something that's impacting on my soul, you don't have to be crying on the floor for half an hour, just recognizing those really crucial but very real things that are in your soul that are blocking your progress and working with them, they all affect the mass soul condition. So, um, while well, AJ's been talking about fate and destiny and, and it um, all sounds quite heavy, um, I've just been receiving a lot of inspiration about how, um, how when people make real soul changes, how powerful that is for the rest of the planet. Um, so a lot of you get hard on yourselves but as long as you're focusing on these real changes, it is just so powerful for everyone. I think so, yeah. The, the issue is not changing in your head, is it? The issue is changing in your heart. You want, we want our hearts to soften, you know? We, we don't want to be the heart of a stone anymore. And we want to have the heart of, you know, a really soft human, human being in the end. That's what we want to do. So that's what, what we need to develop. So what, what we need to do if we do that is as we change, every little tiny change we make is going to affect everybody around us. So just when I make the one change of, oh, I'm no longer going to please women anymore if I'm a man, that's not going to be my focus anymore. My focus is going to be living in truth with the woman. My focus is going to be living in love with the woman, but not pleasing her just because she's angry in fact if she's ever angry with me again i'm not going to please her while she's angry i'm going to automatically do the opposite of what she wants rather than do what i was doing before as soon as i make that one change as a male every woman around me will feel that change every woman and every woman then will feel drawn into looking at herself and going wow i can't control him anymore how does that feel how do i feel a bit out of control now like this doesn't feel very nice <laughs> and she will be able to start working through her stuff. But you, can you see that every single person can do this? Like we, all we need to do is focus on our own changes that we need to make. And it's a focus on um, practicing love in our life every day and making very um, that desire, that desire that you have for God as your goal and making very firm and they don't have to be huge steps but just firm soul changes within yourself. That is the most powerful thing. And we've, and we've really, to be there, we've got to stop justifying in ourselves unloving behaviour. You know? We are so tempted to do this. We keep, we keep going down the track of going, oh yeah, I was angry. <laughs> That's funny, wasn't it? You know? No, it wasn't funny. Do you think it was funny for the person you were angry towards? No, it wasn't funny. It hurt them probably. And, and if they were not at one with God, it probably most certainly hurt them, right? And, and all this rage coming out of me, what does it feel like? What does it feel like when rage comes towards you and hits you? How do you feel? You know, spirits often describe it as all of this brownie red gunk just entering the person the so and, and colorizing or coloring the person's soul. They see the spirit body actually change with the color. And when you project fear at somebody else, all this grey, black murk exits your soul and enters the, so enters the soul of another. And their whole spirit body goes grey as a result of it. Right? When, when you're a spirit, you can see these interactions that are happening because of what's going on with everyone. 
But when we're here on earth, we think, oh, it's not really happening. All I need to do is say it's not happening, <laughs> and it's not happening. But the truth is it's still happening while we've still got the emotion. Yeah? Is there anything else you'd like to... No, just that, uh, as you were saying, you know, very often we're addicted to these unloving behaviours. It feels safe and it feels in control, being angry or uh, holding on to that, um, the fear, justifying our fear in our everyday life. But um, it really is a joyous thing to love each other as well. We focus a lot on, on this path, on... Um, receiving love from God and some of us are now starting to feel love for God and but the truth is God really has a lot of joy in loving us and we can have a lot of joy in loving one another on this path mm. yeah so so don't feel though that getting into loving another is about actually any act necessarily that you perform because it's not really about the act you perform it's the emotional act you perform towards them yeah, Does that of, make sense? Of being willing to release the fear, of letting go of the control that you have in anger. Just those things make you more loving to everyone around you. Yeah. And so while, while, I'm, while I'm just even sitting here projecting my rage at you, I am affecting you and I'm not engaged in a loving act. My soul is being degraded by this unloving act, just me just sitting in this rage towards you. Why, when I go and punch my punching bag and feel my rage and connect to the underlying grief, now it's not going towards you. I'm not damaging you anymore. Now I'm owning it and feeling it and releasing it. Now my own soul is growing and your soul isn't being harmed by my growth. But we often go, oh yeah, that was your law of attraction. You know, I, I just dumped on you emotionally, but that was your law of attraction. You've got to look at that. You know, that's like coming along and bopping somebody in the nose and then saying, Oh, that's your law of attraction. You've got to look at that. <laughs> In the end, can you see that that is an unloving act? And yes, while that might be that person's law of attraction, whose soul is degrading in the process? Isn't it your own? And how much better to trigger someone's feelings around being unloved? You can trigger them by bopping them in the nose or you can tr trigger them by loving them completely. You will trigger the same emotion. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what we'd like to do with this issue of fate and destiny, getting back to the subject, is that, is that we, we would like you to consider focusing on your destiny and using all of your effort, emotional effort, to focus on that destiny, plan your life around that destiny. Do you know what I mean? Make the changes and the different things in your life change that need to change so that you can more accurately find that destiny and then let fate take its own actions to deal with the emotions that come up in you in other words let the law of attraction and let all everybody else's law of attraction everything just be drawn to you to bring up emotions in you in a way to me it sort of feels like um another way that god is ensuring that we have such a pure desire in our heart for him that we would be willing to um forego what our fate is in order to have this beautiful destiny mm. and the beauty is that every one of you who do this will actually experience a fate that is actually quite beautiful as well the more of us that do it the more certain that fate comes in line with the destiny you see if only one of us do it then the high likelihood is our fate is going to be death very quickly thereafter but if lots of us do it then the likelihood of our fate being that fate is very unlikely because more and more and more and more of us are carrying on the same message. Does that make sense to everyone? So while one of us choose to focus on the destiny, forget about everything else, and I'm not saying forget about acting in love, I'm saying forget about you know the, the different earthly possessions that you might own and forget about the earthly desires you have and so forth. Focus on the, des the, the destiny of being at one with God, being at one with your soulmate. The focus on that destiny and when you focus on that destiny what will, what will happen is that if there's only one of you in that place you'll get to a point where you'll confront everybody else and they'll get so angry with you they'll probably want to shoot you right? but if there's a hundred of us in that place there's a lot of murders they're going to have to commit right? before they'll be satisfied and, and, uh, and before they'll have any result 
So, so the beauty is the more and more of us that can get into that focusing on that destiny and fate, the happier we're going to be. And on top of that, the more positive effect there's going to be on the planet as well. Yeah. So that's what we wanted to talk about with you today, those two issues. And um, hopefully you've enjoyed the discussion of those two issues. Tomorrow the issue uh, well, the, well, I want to discuss with you is having a burning desire for God, having a passion for God. And actually there is a download if you want to have a look at what I'm going to talk about. There's a download on the internet um, on the Divine Truth website um, under, I think it's under Divine Love Documents and you'll see some documents written by myself and in there there's a, there's a document, I think it says AJ Miller and the document is a burning desire for God or a burning passion for God or something like that it's called. So if you want to have a re read of that before you come tomorrow that's fine but that's the material that I'll be presenting tomorrow. So thank you again for your time tonight. See you later everyone. And